I'm going to say something that surprises people. I Google things. Not because I don't know what I'm doing, but purely and simply because it saves a load of time. You see, good diagnostics isn't about proving how clever you are. It's about getting to the answer efficiently. If a problem is common, there's a good chance the manufacturer already knows about it. So I read technical bulletins as well. You'd be amazed how many times people don't read technical bulletins. You checked for any technical bulletins on that fault yet? Nah, I ain't got time for all that nonsense, mate. I'll suss it myself. Suit yourself. And they spend hours on a job only to find out there was a bulletin that they could have found the problem immediately. So it's not cheating. It's using available information instead of wasting time. If nothing obvious comes up, that's when I slow down. If I don't find anything on Google, these forums, or I don't find anything on these technical bulletins, I then familiarise myself with how the system is supposed to work. If you don't know how it works, you'll never solve it. That's not always easy. Some manufacturers don't have really good functional descriptions. And it's based usually on experience in them cases. You can't diagnose anything. I'll underscore that. You can't diagnose a fault if you don't understand the system. I don't start by replacing parts. Maybe once, twice, second count on me, and in years I've done that. Usually I start with the circuit. How does it work? Power supply, grounds, through the protection of that circuit, through fuses and relays and things like that. Through the control circuit, could be ECU switching things through to loads. Of course it varies. There's sensors and stuff we can throw in there, but you need to understand what's going on in that system. I always test, this is the most important thing I want you to remember, always test the easiest possible point in the circuit. There's lots of points you can choose. It comes with experience, but if you can, basically find the easiest point, because if it don't work there, it won't work anywhere else, will it? Most people though, especially customers, they think diagnostics is just simply plugging in a diagnostic scan tool or a computer. Well, that ain't diagnosing a car. That's asking a car what it, it thinks is wrong. Well, don't you know what's wrong with it? You've got a fault code. Cars lie all the time. The software engineers, they're not mechanics, a lot of them. And sometimes the diagnostic fault codes don't really match up to the real life fault in the car. It's not about tools diagnostics either. It's like the expensive tools, you see all these expensive tools, they don't make you good. Thinking makes you good. I worked with a guy once who had all the tools. As they say, all show and no go. Fault codes don't tell you what's broken. Really, sometimes they do, but mainly they don't. They can sometimes give you a code. The fault can be in a totally different system. Depends how the engineers, software engineers built the architecture. All they tell you is what the computer's unhappy about. The code tells you where to look, not what to replace. Just remember that. Not what to replace, where to look. It might be the wrong place you're looking at. Real diagnostics is proving something is good or it's bad. Not guessing, not hoping, testing. That's my new logo. Test. Don't, rep don't guess, test. Experience, like I've got over 30 years, it doesn't mean I know everything. Believe me. When you think you know everything, there's always someone who knows 10 times more than you. What it means is that you've seen patterns before. And I see a lot of patterns in this job. Cars change, but physics doesn't change, does it? It's, an, it's a, known, a known quantity. The laws of physics are pretty much stuck as they are. They're static. They're not like randomly changing all the time because we live in a kind of predictable, un predictable universe. That's how I diagnose cars. I search first. I read forums, Google, technical bulletins. I learn the system. Then I test at the easiest point. That's real diagnostics, that. That's how you do it. So what we're going to do now, I just thought I'd throw in a random example. We're going to put one of my wiring diagrams on. And this is off a BMW, but it's kind of my own diagram. We're going to take a very basic example. And we're going to flash it on the board now. And we're going to go through it. Right, let's walk through this diagram properly because this is where Lin bus faults catch people out. This is off a F40 1 series and it's my version of a BMW wiring diagram. 
So let's get familiarized with this diagram. That's the whole point of this video. On the left, you have a Lin Master. That's the air conditioning computer or control unit or panel, depending on what car you're looking at. And it provides three things to every flat motor. These are all flat motors, these. It provides a Lin signal here, a power supply here, and it also provides diagnostics for any whenever any of these motors go faulty. Of course, you've got a ground here as well, what supplies the, the stepper motors. This single Lin wire runs across the eater box and physically passes through each flat motor connector, like so. Here's the first flat motor. On the diagram, you're going to see a Lin bus here. You'll see one coming in on pin two and one going out on pin three. Now, this does not mean that this flat motor processes a signal and forwards it. Lin is still a parallel bus electrically. Every motor is just tapping into the same wire. But, and this is the important bit, physically the wiring is so-called daisy chain. So you've got in on pin two, out on three, in on one, out on two, in on two, out on three, two, 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 so on. The limb wire actually enters the motor, the stepper motor, and then it continues on to the next one, just with a soldered connection. Nothing fancy about it. Each connector is a physical, also a physical link in the harness. So electrically, it's a shared bus, but physically, it's wired in series. Although it's a parallel bus, if that makes sense. Now then, let's look at a scope trace. This is a healthy-ish scope trace on the limb bus. And it sits near battery voltage with clean pull-up and pull-downs as the master talks to each slave. Each motor only responds when it's addressed. Right, let's look at a fault scenario on this. You get lucky. Let's take this flat motor here, this third flat motor. One flat motor is dead. It's mechanically failed. But it's Lin electronics are still behaving. Just look at the scope, it's still clean. The bus stays alive, you don't have any problem. You've just got a fault code. One non-moving flap, the rest still work. So this hasn't affected any of these other flaps. That's the easiest diagnostic case you'll ever get because you just basically take it out and put a new one in and try it. However, scenario two is when you get shorted actuator that corrupts the bus or a shorted stepper motor that corrupts the bus. Look at this bad scope trace. Now, this is quite a nasty one. If one flap motor, any of these, internally shorts the Lin line, either to ground or to power, or in this case, just a corruption. Unfortunately, the entire bus will be corrupted, as in this waveform. The signal just collapses. So then you'll get fault code from this master unit on the OB EOBD network through the gateway that all of these are dead. The master here cannot talk to any of these slave stepper motors. Simple as that. Every flap looks faulty, even though one motor is actually the problem. One broken slave can poison the whole network. And if you get unlucky, that's the case. Additionally, if you unplug any of these, you'll end up with no comms with the units after it. We'll come on to that in a minute. Here's another scenario, a short to ground. You look at this scope trace, we've pulled to ground there. If a motor shorts to ground, the whole bus gets dragged to ground, gets dragged low. No data transmissions, no communication, everything is dead. All of these are dead. Again, master will signal to gateway module. You'll read it on your OBD tool. You've got a fault with every single stepper motor. And the other scenario, as in this scope trace here, is when you have a short to battery voltage. Same story as a ground or a corrupted unit. If the lens short it to 12 volts, the line is stuck high. The master can't pull it down. And the entire network goes silent. Again, signals to gateway module across the CAN bus that all these units are dead. In reality, you've only got one unit, haven't you? That may be usually what's brought the whole bus down. We'll come on to that again in a minute. Another scenario is <clears throat> you have an unplugged motor. Let's go to the middle actuator. This is where the physical wiring matters. The Lin wire physically passes through each motor. Let's say this pin 
sorry, pin two and pin three. If you unplug that connector, you've then put an open circuit in the middle of the limb bus. So, so these two units here, 208A and 206A, they won't communicate with this master. Everything downstream disappears, if that makes sense. Uh, sorry, upstream disappears. Downstream, the, all these three will have com or these two will have comms, but these won't have comms because you've disconnected it. That's not a LIN protocol fault, it's a wiring break. So the correct diagnostic approach with this would be to get your wiring diagram and familiarise yourself with how it works and scope. That's why you don't guess. If you've got fault code for one unit, you go straight to that unit if you can get to it. It might be buried, but you check the unit out, disconnect it, plug a spare one and you can get one on these and pop it in and, and readdress it. Watch the limb voltage recover. If, if you have one on these, what's shorted, let's say, you've got to unplug them one at a time. If you've got a fault code for all five, you don't know which one it is. Just unplug one at a time. When the limb comes back to life, you found the guilty motor. Okay, you might have a wiring fault. That's a bit more tricky. You have a, you have a short ear to ground. Well, you just need to work through that. But generally speaking, if you've got, you unplug the unit one by one, essentially, starting from the very back one, if they're all knackered. If you start here, you lose them anyway, don't you? So you unplug this, still bad signal, unplug that, unplug that. Ah, now I've got a good signal, right, so you know it's that unit. And that's why good diagnost diagnostic starts with un understanding the system and not actually physically replacing parts, you see. For more advanced fault finding tips like these, make sure you hit the subscribe button. And I'll see you in the next video.